So those are my disclosures. We have a unique problem in medicine. We have an unbelievably effective therapy that patients aren't getting. We have a cure for the most severe ischemic strokes, uh, but patients aren't getting it. So why? The first reason is we don't know the denominator. We don't know the number of cases out there. If a patient comes into the emergency room and they have chest pain, they get an electrocardiogram. The world has not caught up, and for every patient that comes in with a stroke, we are not getting vessel imaging. So every patient that comes into an emergency department with a stroke needs vessel imaging. Another reason is that we're too slow. For every minute faster, we get these vessels open, patients gain a week of independent free living, but our systems of care are too slowly delivered. And finally, there's been some chatter about, well, there are not enough people out there to do this, but that's really not correct. We wrote this essay about the 1943 Bengal uh, famine, killed 3 million people, but there was plenty of rice, it just wasn't distributed uh, uh, appropriately. So we have an organization problem. And that's the reason I'm here to talk about systems of care. We need to focus on systems of care because we know that mechanical thrombectomy doubles the likelihood of a good outcome. But if we're talking about the 2% of patients eligible in the late, uh, in the late window, um, we're really not going to bend the stroke care cost curve. The major randomized control trials were evaluating people between three and six hours after symptom onset. But we, what we want to do is change our systems of care so we're doubling the likelihood of a good outcome for as many patients as possible. And we want to be in that green circle. We want to get green. So we're going to talk about optimizing systems of care. We're going to start in the cath lab and we're going to move backwards from at the mothership and eliminate bottlenecks and optimize systems of care for stroke. So to open the vessel quickly, you want to be prepared, you want to standardize your setup, and you also want to execute a good technique. So standardizing cases. All three neurointerventionalists at Rhode Island Hospital do this case with the same equipment the same way. Um, because we did that, or because we agreed to that, we reduced our procedure time by 30 minutes. Um, we feel it worked because it reduces the cognitive load of the entire team. So everyone knows what equipment's being opened, everyone knows we're doing the case with conscious sedation. The only question that needs to be asked for any of those cases is what shape diagnostic catheter do you want to use, and what size stent retriever do you want to use? When you standardize, you can leave your room in an elbow ready state. It takes us five minutes to open this equipment and prepare it. Like I said, there are no questions. There are only two questions that need to be answered. And then we also want to do a, a employ a good technique. So you can be fast, but in 2019, you need to open the vessel well. We need complete reperfusion. So why do we need better uh, 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 reperfusion or more complete reperfusion? Well, the answer comes from Aster. When they looked at Tiki 2 c 3 compared with 2B or lesser reperfusion, you can see that no matter how they divine, define the outcome, favorable outcome at 90 days, early neurological improvement, change in NIH stroke scale, uh, mortality, Tiki 2 c 3 is better than Tiki 2 b okay? Tiki 2 b should be a bust. And then the other important thing to emphasize is that Tiki 2 c 3 will modify the effect of time and age. So this graph on the left is from um, the NASA registry, and that blue line represents Tiki 2 b reperfusion. And for the same pound-for-pound pound onset to reperfusion, say 325 minutes, if you get Tiki 2 b there's a 50% good outcome. If you get Tiki 3 you bump that up to 75%. Uh, complete reperfusion also modifies the effect of age. So we know that older patients tend to do poorly. So the, the, blue, the green line and the red line show that as people age, they have worse outcomes, worse ranking scores at 90 days. But the blue line shows that if you get complete reperfusion, the effect of age is modified so that it's a flat line. You, patients that are older can get good outcomes. So traditional techniques achieve only complete uh, recanalization about 20 to 30% of the time. Um, and we wanted to improve that. So we developed this throw the kitchen sink at it technique captive. And the reason we did that is because we want first pass uh, complete reperfusion. And the goal is to go back to bed. We do about 20 to 25 cases a month amongst three guys. And we want to go in there, get the case done in 15 minutes and get all the blood vessel uh, blood vessels restored. So that's very motivating. So I don't want to spend too much time on captive. The bottom line is it's a primary combined approach just like save, um, uh, just like save, and the goal is to take the best of both techniques. You best of uh, the stent retriever, best of aspiration. Use a balloon guide and try to pull the clot out as one chunk that's not disrupted or fragmented. Um, and the, the continuous aspiration prior to the retrieval is important because what you're doing is as you approach that clot, you're reducing the clot burden so you're more likely to pull it out on that first pass. 
Um, so let's move on to the treatment decision. So factors in the treatment tradition, uh, decision typically are time from onset, clinical deficit, site of occlusion, and infarct core. Well, we know about Don and Diffuse 3. Don is the greatest absolute difference in functional outcome between two groups. Diffuse 3 was the greatest difference in mortality and severe disability. And Greg Albers explained a little earlier why that is so the, the uh, late window paradox. So we take from those two trials, and now we know from Aurora that imaging, not time, determines the candidacy for mechanical thrombectomy. The tissue is the issue. This is what you should be telling your teams. This is uh, what you should be telling your partners. Don't make any decisions on the clock. The imaging determines uh, whether the patient's a candidate for mechanical thrombectomy. What about those low NIH stroke scales? Well, those, low, those NIH stroke scales are low because collaterals are carrying the patient. They're eventually going to give out. If you look Look at the Hermes meta-analysis, there's a benefit across the NIH stroke scale. And then we're getting into Jens's talk a little bit here. The Hermes 7 uh, meta-analysis showed to our surprise that even patients with low aspects seem to be benefiting from mechanical thrombectomy. And then exactly right, this is a fabulous paper, uh, the Beyond Swift uh, study that looked at 237 patients with an aspects of 0 and 5. And again, it's sort of like that Aster paper. If you look at any definition of good outcome, 0 to 3, 0 to 2, change in NIH stroke scale, early neurological improvement, and mortality, Doing the case, getting the vessel open makes a difference. Don't go for the home runs. Another goal is to just get the rank and shift. If you shift the rank and scale for these patients, you're going to save the healthcare system money. If you change someone from a four to a three, from a five to a four, you're going to save downstream healthcare costs. So the goal is not to get a home run on every case. You can't cherry pick. Um, and, and to a certain extent, and I don't mean to be inflammatory, that's in part what RAPID is doing. Don't cherry pick the case, do the case, get the vessel open. The patients are gonna do better than if you do nothing. Um, so if there's an occlusion it's, and there's a decent CT scan and um, we use multi-phase CTA as well, we just get the vessel open. We do use advanced imaging to confirm or justify our decision to pass, never to select to go. So that decision to pass might be under a suspicion for underlying ICAD, a low NIH stroke scale M2, and then to confirm your wipeout. So you think the aspects is four, you don't think you're going to do the case, get a quick DWI to confirm your decision to pass. Um, so what about the imaging? CTA is to ELVO what ECG is to STEMI. This is a line you should be using with all your spoke hospital partners, trying to uh, educate them and enchant them. Um, to get vessel imaging on every patient. If they use a clinical severity score, you're going to miss emergent large vessel occlusions. Those collaterals are going to give out, and then their patients are going to do poorly. So the modern approach to acute stroke imaging is get that CT scan, bleed, no bleed, big infarct, no big infarct, and then it's, an absolute, it's absolutely essential that vessel imaging is done and you confirm or exclude the worst thing it could be, a large vessel occlusion. So what about initial hospital arrival? to that imaging. So we have a dedicated group of stroke APPs. They live, breathe, and uh, eat stroke. Uh, they're there 24 seven. They meet the patient at the door. They take them to the CT scanner. They take them to the biplane neuroangiography suite. They're doing the cases with us. They can independently do cerebral angiography. They've deployed stent retrievers. They eliminate practice variability in the system. They take the patient to the stroke uh, floor afterwards. We take the patients direct to CT. We get a multi-phase CTA on every single code stroke patient, regardless of the degree of deficit. Never ask about a creatinine, uh, about a contrast allergy, never test a creatinine. And then another paradigm shift that we've employed is that we take first call. Stroke is now a surgical disease, and the guys that are making the decision to or not do the case get the first call. All this imaging is plugged into our phone. It takes me 30 seconds to read a CTA and determine if there's a clot there or not. That is, saves an hour of time for that patient in the old system whereby um, you're going through a different channel. So you have to engage. It's a new world. It sort of sucks. I'll be honest with you. It's tiresome, but you have to do it for the patients. Um, and then what about doing the case in the emergency department? Our go and I'm going to show you how we do that. So the goal is for mothership elbow patients, door to vessel open in less than 60 minutes. For our transfers, you don't need to repeat imaging. We do the case, door to vessel open within 30 minutes of arrival. So let's take a look at these cases. Occlusion and a decent CT scan. Zero to 24 hours, this is our paradigm, okay? Zero to 24 hours. 
top panel, top row, left distal M1 occlusion, good collaterals, get the vessel open, zero to 24 hours. Middle panel, left ICA terminus occlusion, intermediate collaterals, get the vessel open, okay? Bottom panel, this is a patient multi-phase CTA, right M1 occlusion, poor collaterals, what's the aspect score? The aspects is good, I don't care what the collaterals are, I'm gonna open the vessel. Um, if the aspects is bad and there's a black hole, which is bad collaterals, then we'll do that uh, diffusion weighted imaging to confirm that. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, you leave that to your imagination, Ricardo. We'll talk about that tonight. All right. So this is the latest. So this is the latest and greatest. Uh, we now have a dedicated neurobiplane suite in our emergency room. So we're doing these cases right in the emergency room. We would be. A, we actually would consider doing direct angio, but I'll tell you, we're so busy. We're just getting that CTA, CTA is to elbow what ECG is to STEMI, and then we bring them right over and get the vessel open. So we've talked about optimizing care delivery at the mothership. Uh, while we have made great strides, the biggest hurdle to to clear is stroke recognition to endovascular center arrival, okay? So how do we get to the right patient to the right hospital as quickly as possible? So streak, stroke geopolitics in Rhode Island are paralyzing um, for the figuratively and, and, and literally for patients. We are the green circle, the only uh, Joint Commission Comprehensive Stroke Center and within 20 miles of our Joint Commission Comprehensive Stroke Center, there are 10 primary stroke centers. So in my opinion, this is irresponsible over accreditation. Um, so we have an organization problem, just like that slide about the, the, the famine in Bengal. How are we gonna improve direct access to the mothership? Well, there are three strategies. Uh, mobile stroke unit technology, you do the CTA on the truck, bring the highest level expertise to someone in their driveway, give TPA there, and then you can very specifically triage if you do a CT angiogram on the mobile stroke unit. Guess what? We don't have one. I tried for a year to get one. Um, I was at the Cleveland Clinic, worked with Peter Rasmussen, knew how to do it, everything was uh, greased, but they didn't wanna throw the resources at it. So I had to find another way to get the patients there. Two strategies, improve primary stroke center workflow, develop innovative transfer processes at the primary stroke center, and then um, educate EMS uh, professionals to identify these patients in the field or suspected elbow patients in the field and bring them straight to us. So I'm gonna now take you through the Rhode Island elbow journey. So before we rolled out this plan, and I got there in July 2015, they did 14 elbows. Now we do 270, okay? So here's the recipe to deliver good care and, and really get to that green circle I showed you, doubling the mechanical thrombectomy rate in the people less than two hours from onset. So in the first six months, we met with the primary stroke centers and we educated them on a primary stroke center elbow protocol and we formed a Rhode Island Stroke Task Force uh, that, uh, and designed a severity-based field triage protocol. What is that primary stroke center elbow protocol? We ask our 15 spoke hospitals to do three things in parallel. If they suspect an elbow based on a clinical severity score, call our transfer center immediately and we wanna start working on transportation. Even if it ends up not being an elbow, we wanna get that transportation rolling early. The second thing is get a CT angiogram on that first trip to the CT scanner. Back and forth trips to the CT scanner are a death knell for the patient. And finally, uh, this is freeware, life image, you can install this and you can share that imaging in the cloud so that we can participate in real time. No matter where I am in the world, I can pull up a CTA and I can talk to someone at a hospital about how to manage a patient. So this is the effect of that primary stroke center elbow uh, workflow. So uh, if we look at onset to reperfusion in patients where it was partially executed or not executed, it was 232 minutes. If it's fully executed, these are all transfer patients, mind you. The onset to reperfusion time for those patients was 184 minutes. That's as good as every mothership paper in any clinical trial, okay? So let's parse that out. So the onset to primary stroke center arrival time in both groups was the same. The recan time in both groups was the same. The 
CSC arrival or endovascular center arrival to groin puncture time was the same in both groups. The transfer time was the same in both groups. The difference in the onset to reperfusion time between the two groups was driven entirely by improved processes at that primary stroke center. So we are now advocating that door in, door out time needs to be a key metric for primary stroke center efficiency, and it is going to be a metric um, next year. So CT angiography at the primary stroke center has advantages. You're only gonna transfer your confirmed elbow patients, and Ricardo alluded to earlier, the comprehensive stroke center is gonna be overwhelmed if all these patients come. They can keep the CTA negative patients, and I will tell you when ER physicians are on the phone with me, they have a lot greater confidence giving TPA if you're telling them, hey, there's a clot there. That's what this drug was designed for. At the Comprehensive Stroke Center, we can plan the procedure prior to arrival. There's fall, less burnout for our team. There are less false alarms, and we go straight to angio. We just commit to doing the case, especially because there appears to be a benefit in large core patients, and we never stop in our emergency room. Door in, door out is important for outcomes. Time is brain, right? Look at the red line. That's the discharge NIH stroke scale for short door in, door out time on the x-axis. If it's 50 minutes, that's good. They have a very low NIH stroke scale at discharge. If the primary stroke center is inefficient and the door in, door out time is long, they have a very bad or high NIH stroke scale at discharge. So now we're back to our epochs. What we do in the next 12 months? Well, we gave P uh, primary stroke center elbow feedback on all those transfers, and then we introduced the EMS field triage uh, concept, and we began education on using the uh, Los Angeles Motor Scale score to triage these patients. That field triage was not yet mandatory. So what is that field triage protocol? So if an EMS professional evaluates a patient and the LAM score is four or five and they're within 30 minutes of our comprehensive stroke center, they always bring the patient directly to us. And we had them execute this out to 24 hours because we knew the treatment effect was gonna be uh, uh, as good from six to 24 as it is for less than six hours. And then if the LAM score is less than four, they take the patient to the closest stroke center, okay? In the third epoch, the last 12 months, EMS education effort was launched, uh, field triage was now required, and then we gave feedback to EMS on how they were doing with regard to that uh, field triage assessment. So now let's look at the data. So these are histograms, okay, of the patients in the first epoch, the first six months of effort, the, the 12 months after that, and then the 12 months at the end, okay? And patients in green are patients that are closest to the comprehensive stroke center. Patients in red are patients that are closest to a primary stroke center. So what happened over time? Can you advance that? There we go. Oh, can you go back? All right, so the middle tertile, the lighter green, now represents patients that were closest to a primary stroke center and went to a comprehensive stroke center. So what you can see is over time in those three epochs, the work we were doing was working. Patients that were closest to our primary stroke center were now going to a comprehensive stroke center over time. And what was the effect of that? So now we're gonna look at data for patients, and this is the real question that needs to be answered. What is the gain of field triage or PSC bypass? So we're gonna look at patients, all patients that were closest to a primary stroke center, and we're gonna compare the outcomes for the patients that bypassed to a comprehensive stroke center or patients that went to the primary stroke center they were closest to. Does that all make sense? Okay. So here's the data. So we're looking at EMS scene departure to TPA, groin puncture, and recanalization. Despite eight additional minutes of drive time, patients that went to the comprehensive stroke center got TPA 17 minutes faster. Despite eight additional minutes of drive time, patients that went to the comprehensive stroke center got a groin puncture 57 minutes earlier. And despite eight additional minutes of drive time, the vessel was open 43 minutes earlier. And guess what? They had better outcomes. So in keeping with the decrease in EMS scene to recanalization time, in that group, 65% of patients had a good outcome versus only 42% that went to the wrong hospital the first time. Okay, so I dressed up like an Avon sales lady over this time period going to every primary stroke center and I begged and I pleaded and I sent feedback forms for every single patient that came and look at the effect of my dress code. 
no improvement. This is a flat line. Over three years, door in, door out time hovered between 90 and 100 minutes. And you know what? Everyone, every EMS professional, every fire chief, every EMS director in Rhode Island knew I was doing this. And because of that, on March 13th, the Ambulance Advisory Board met and they said, you know what? Despite Ryan's greatest efforts to improve door and out time, door and out time it's not working. So we are going to get rid of that 30-minute threshold. So now in Rhode Island, if an EMS professional sees a person or assesses a person and the LAM score is four or five, irrespective of drive time, they go to the Comprehensive Stroke Center. There is too much practice variability to overcome at 15 different hospitals. And they wanna do what's right for patients and that's why they eliminated this drive time uh, distance. So this is what happens when it all works. At 11.50, this 78-year-old male was seen by his wife to have right-sided weakness and difficulty speaking. She decided nine minutes later to perhaps keep him around. Um, 10 minutes later, EMS arrived at the scene. They assessed the patient. LAM score was five. They were within 30 minutes of the comprehensive stroke center. They left the scene. They pre-notified Rhode Island Hospital. They had this LAM score five. Um, they got to the hospital about 20 minutes after 12. APPs met the patient, took the patient directly to CT scan. We got the multi-phase CTA. Left M1 occlusion was seen. IVTPA was given. They go to the IR suite at uh, 36 after the hour, and then the groin is uh, open less than 20 minutes later, or the, the blood vessels open less than 20 minutes later. So all this happened in less than two hours, okay? This blood vessel was open in about two hours from onset, and two hours later, he was asking, can I go home now? And this was a former professor uh, at Brown University. Um, so... Onset to reperfusion in less than two hours. This hasn't even been modeled in any of the papers. People don't think it exists. So if you look at all these time from onset and outcome curves, they never look at less than two hours. Um, every single paper, because, uh, but we believe in unicorns in Rhode Island. Um, I actually wear a unicorn shirt when I go and talk to uh, firefighters uh, to let them know that they can do this. Um, and if you really focus on systems of care, if you engage with these guys, we are very routinely achieved this. And it really matters. If we're gonna spend, uh, bend the stroke scale, this stroke uh, cost curve, we have to get to patients within two hours um, and do mechanical thrombectomy on them. So in summary, elbow is the most time sensitive diagnosis in medicine. Standardize your setup and always be elbow ready. First uh, pass complete reperfusion, Tiki 2 c 3 is the key. CTA is to elbow what ECG is to STEMI. If you have occlusion and a decent scan, just get the vessel open, zero to 24 hours. Don't have a different system for six to 24 or less than six. If there's a decent scan and there's an occlusion, just open the vessel. Um, neurointervention should be taking first call, strokes of surgical disease. Engaging EMS professionals is the most gratifying thing you'll do in your career. Um, do it and, and also engage with your primary stroke center partners because this field triage is not perfect. There will be fallouts. And then always support legislative efforts to change the point of entry for stroke. It should be just like trauma. Go to the level one stroke center, just like traumas go to uh, level one stroke center, just like traumas go to the level one stroke center, uh, tra trauma center, and let's leave no elbow behind. Thanks for your time. <laughs> tried, to, tried to catch us up there. Any questions? Ph phenomenal, Ryan. I think... Uh... Uh, you, you spark right at the EMS symposium starts in about half an hour, but I think you see uh, why, why Ryan here, the work that Ryan and Mahesh have done in Rhode Island, I think is just phenomenal. It should be carbon copy. Uh, I think uh, you guys are inspiration for what we do here. Uh, I think it's just very, very inspiring. I have a lot of EMS people in the room. Uh, there is a, a living unicorn there. You're going to learn his story. It's a, a Sintamon Sat to reperfusion one hour and 25 minutes or something like that. And that what the power of uh, intervening quick as you show, show us. Florida Rico study. In Florida, it takes five hours and a half for a patient to recognize that he's having a stroke. So I think we have a tremendous task ahead of us. What you showed us is just phenomenal. It's possible. Uh, hats off for you guys, it's just great. Uh, legislation. What you guys have done, and Charlie's going to talk about our Florida uh, uh, effort here. What you guys have done in Rhode Island to convince people, because of our problem, EMS very often have their handcuffed. By law, they have to take this to the closest stroke center. And as you said, that's a, that's a mistake. 
Uh, so it, it gets complicated. I mean, you have to find champions. Uh, you have to find a legislator that's, that's willing to put his name on the bill. That legislator has to be seen as favorable within the assembly. The, you know, it could be the right thing, but there are a couple things. One is they all want to be paid. You all got to uh, pay for their ca uh, campaign contributions. The next thing they want to know is, well, how's this going to get me in trouble? So Massachusetts, unlike Rhode Island, is very complicated. The first thing everyone asks is, who's coming after me if I support this? And the Massachusetts uh, Medical Society is a very powerful lobby. And there's a lot of posturing that happens if people feel they're going to be losing business. So we are a little blessed in Rhode Island because it's a little more of a Petri dish that can be controlled. We had a great legislative uh, champion. Very importantly, you uh, get EMS professionals behind you and, and medical directors to support you. It's an absolutely a team effort, um, but it is, it is complicated. In Massachusetts right now, they just, despite two years of giving talks and two years of, of talking in front of the legislation, they just finally decided on a, on a clinical severity score to use FAST-ED. We use LAMS. But I was just down in Houston two weeks ago, and, and Houston can't even figure out what clinical severity score uh, they want to use. So um, it's very, in, it's infuriating to me, especially when you have this sort of data um, that uh, politics continue to get in the way. And, and I can tell you that even after showing this data, the Hospital Association of Rhode Island uh, uh, that uh, has a lobby, they're constantly trying to throw wrenches in this. Uh, um, and after the EMS Advisory Board decided to eliminate the 30-minute threshold, there are a whole another series of conversations. So it's, it's amazing what people will do um, to not push patients first. It's very frustrating. So be prepared. Thank you. Thank you.